We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey church, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor and if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I would love to meet you in the lobby or the cafe at some point uh, during or between services, not during, that would be weird. Um, just stay there. Uh, Hey, we are in the second week of a series. We're going through the book of James together. So grab your Bible and open up to James chapter 1. And while uh, you're doing that, I want to encourage you with uh, any of you ever, uh, how many of you are doing the job that you wanted to be when you were little? How many of you? Believe it or not, it's not many people, right? The very first thing I wanted to be when I was growing up was a fireman. And that never worked out. I have terrible asthma. So it's just, my parents should have just said, that's probably not a good idea. Um, and then the, the next thing I wanted to be when I was in middle school and high school was uh, it, n- more like uh, middle school. I wanted to be a lawyer. I was really excited about that. It was about sophomore year of high school that God called me into ministry. And so I've always loved the idea of debating. I've always loved the the idea of studying logic and understanding some of those things. And, and so the idea of being a lawyer has always been uh, kind of appealed to me. And so with that in mind, today I want to use this overarching analogy in what I'm planning to teach. And that overarching analogy is going to be uh, uh, something that comes out of law school. Can I take you guys to law school this morning? I've never been, so if you're a lawyer in here and I get this totally wrong, uh, come tell me afterwards. But I'm hoping that at the end of my message this morning, you all can go take the bar and pass, all right? So we'll see. Um, Who knows? Uh, Today, what we're going to talk about is this concept that James mentioned uh, multiple times in his letter, and it's the concept of faith and works. This concept of what happens when you claim to be a person of faith but you don't have any action to back it up. What does that look like? And so what we're going to do is going to read some scripture together. I have a bunch of passages. And so uh, we don't normally do this, but today, would you mind standing with me as I read God's word? I'm going to read uh, five different chunks of scripture. They'll be up on the screen for you. Here's what they say. In James chapter one, verse 19, it says, understand this, My dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So get rid of all the filth and the evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God, the word God has planted in your hearts, for he has the power to save your souls. And it goes on in verse 22, it says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you have heard, then God will bless you for doing it. How about verse 26? It says, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. You're going to notice a theme so far in these last three passages that there's, there's something to supporting what you say you believe with the way you behave. There's something about faith and works. And so these last two verses I'm going to put up on the screen, I want to ask you all to say them out loud with me, all right? We're going to uh, skip to James chapter 2, verse 14. Let's all read this together. It says, What good is it 
dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions. That, that fine. You guys are better readers than I am. Great job. James chapter two, verse 17. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. God, we thank you right now for the reading of your word. I ask that you would help me to clearly communicate the truth that you want us to glean from your, your truth, the Bible, today. Would you help each of us to know what it is that you're putting on our hearts to, to take not just the thought of it or the word of it, but to apply it to our lives in action? Would you give us something to do and give us the courage to do it today so we can be more like your son? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, you can have a seat right where you are. So I, I said we're going to go to law school today, and I, I hope this analogy will help us understand this concept of faith versus works, right? We understand if you've been in church for a while, you know that you are not saved by anything you do. You don't work your way into salvation. So when James talks about works still being an important part of the equation, how does that fit into the agreement we have with God? Think about this for a moment. What we're going to do for, from a law school perspective, I went on to the Cornell Law School website and I learned in, in uh, what I would call contract law 101 that there are five elements that have to be in place for a contract to be valid. Now, if you were on the men's retreat, don't shout out the answers. You already know what they are, right? But there are five things that are required, and if you don't have one of the five things, you can take that contract to a judge, and the judge will throw the whole thing out because all five things are required. So let me tell you what those are, all right? The first one is this thing called legality. In other words, the contract that you have must uh, provide a sense of, uh, it, it's going to be covering something that's legal. If you and I have a contract, I'm going to pay you $1,000 to go kill someone, Right? You could probably take that contract to a judge and say, hey, I think I'm going to fight my way out of this contract because it's not legal. And you would be right. right? That contract would be null and void. I'd go to jail. Right? So it's got to be legal. Well, what about the agreement? If you are a follower of Jesus in this room, what about the agreement you made when you entered into this relationship with God? In Isaiah, it says this, in verse, or chapter 33, verse 22, it says, For the Lord is our judge, our lawgiver, and our king. Those of you who understand constitutional law would recognize on the screen behind me, you have all three branches of government. You have the judicial branch, the legislative branch, and the executive branch, and God is in charge of all of them. Right? So when it comes to deciding what's legal and what's not, you know, obviously God can pass laws, he can create laws, and then he can enforce the laws, and he gets to decide whether or not they're legit laws or not. And by the way, if he makes them, they're, they're good. So when we enter into a contract with God, it's legal. It's a, it's a legal contract, all right? How about the, the, the second thing that's required for a contract to be valid is this thing called consideration, and here's what consideration is. Consideration, simply put, means that both parties have to have some skin in the game. So if I have a contract with you, uh, if I think I have a contract with you, and what it simply says is, I agree, you say, I agree to give Matt my car, period. That's not a legally binding contract. You'd be able to go and have that thing destroyed because, simply put, there's no consideration on my part. So what we'd have to do is rewrite the contract that says, I agree to give Matt my car in exchange for $8,000 that Matt's going to give me. And now you got consideration. Both parties have some skin in the game. So thinking of that from the perspective of the agreement we entered into with God, what is the consideration on both parties' parts of this thing that we have going on? Those of you who made a decision to follow Jesus, in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that 
we could be made right with God through Christ. In other words, this is what the contract sounds like on my, on, uh, in my case. This is what it sounds like. God says, listen, I'm willing to give up my son's life, my only son's life on the cross in exchange for a relationship with Matt, should Matt want that. I'm willing to give up my son's life on the cross in exchange for a relationship with Matt. But really think about it for a moment. I don't really have what it takes to enter into a relationship with God. I, I, I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I've got all sorts of filth in my life, right? All, and don't look at me like that. That's you too, okay? We're all, we're all messed up people. Let me use that car illustration again. Imagine that, we, that we're going to have this agreement, right? That you want to sell me your car, but you want $8,000. There's got to be consideration. But imagine that yesterday you gifted me $8,000. You wired it into my account, right? You Venmoed it over to me, and now I got $8,000. And now today you're saying, I'm going to willingly, let's make a contract. I'm going to give you my car in exchange for $8,000. Technically, I don't really have any skin in the game, but the contract is still valid. Certainly, I'm paying you with your own money, but at the end of the day, you granted me this gift, and I'm able to... Uh, here's the way it works with God. I don't have any ability to enter into a relationship with God because I'm filth, right? I have this, this, uh, this lack of righteousness. In God's mind, he, he's light, and in him there is no darkness. So we got ourselves a problem, but God says, listen, Matt... If you want to enter into this agreement, I'm going to impugn my righteousness into your account. And because you're now credited with righteousness, you can enter into a relationship with me. I'm willing to give up my son on the cross in exchange for a relationship with you that you can only afford because I gave you my righteousness. It doesn't seem really fair, but it's technically a valid contract so far. We got this thing called consideration. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that you have done, that we have done. So none of us can boast about it. In other words, you cannot earn this title of righteousness on your own. It can only be granted to you by God through his son's death on the cross. Because at the end of the day, if you could work for it, if you could do enough things that eventually your account is like, wow, there's righteousness here. Matt has earned a relationship with God. Then you could boast about it. But God is very clear. You don't have what it takes. So this consideration, though it exists, it doesn't really seem very fair, does it? One way to think about this is an agreement that my senior year in college, I was at Liberty University. The college campus was, let's say, this big. And there was a property right next to it that was about the same size. And it was owned by a cell phone plant uh, that had gone out of business named Ericsson. All right. So the Ericsson cell phone plant was touching our property. And it was worth millions of dollars, a huge piece of land, a whole bunch of structures on that land. Well, the owners of Hobby Lobby bought the Ericsson plant for fair market value. They paid millions of dollars for it. They had some sort of legal contract. You're going to give us the property. We're going to give you millions of dollars. That was all done. Well, then what Hobby Lobby did is they turned around and created a contract with Liberty University and said, we are going to give you the property in exchange for $1. You think, well, why would they even need a dollar? At that point, what's the, what, is it like a joke? No, they needed a legal contract. There needed to be consideration. That's why you'll often find people are like, hey, I'm going to lease this to you for a dollar. There's got to be consideration on both parts. It wasn't fair. But out of love for the vision of the university, the owners of Hobby Lobby decided we want to do this. And so they were able to enter into a very unbalanced agreement, but a legal agreement. God loves you that much and was willing to give you what you needed to be able to enter into an agreement with him and what he wanted to provide to you. So that's what we're going to call consideration. Let's, let's think about the next thing that a contract requires is something called mutual assent. And here's what mutual assent means. It means that both parties 
have to want this agreement. In other words, if one party was forced into the agreement or they were tricked into the agreement, if there was some sort of fraud that made them sign the agreement, they can get out of it because they can prove, I didn't want this thing. That's not what I thought I was getting, right? Mutual assent means that you freely give God your love and he freely gives you his love. It's both parties want to be a part of this thing. Notice, it's really important to understand this, that God does not force his way into anyone's heart. In other words, love isn't really love unless it's freely given. If God programmed you so that every 30 seconds you just said, I love you, God, then God would know that that's not the love that he desires because that's not really love at all. He didn't program you to love him. He gave you the the freedom to choose whether or not you're going to love him. By the way, that's why he had to put a tree in the middle of the garden. If you've ever wondered, why did God even put that tree there? Because he knew if Adam and Eve had no choice but to live in a perfect relationship with God forever, that's not really love because it's not freely given. So he put a choice in the middle of the garden. And he said, listen, you can choose to do things my way and show me love, or you can choose to do things your way and eat from the tree. And we chose. We all know how that went down. And you and I, we, we have inherited this sin issue And so God now doesn't force his way into your life. He sent his son to fix that that, that mistake, right? And he says, listen, you now have the ability to enter into this agreement, but you have to want it. I'm not going to force you. Let me say this really clearly. There's not a single one of you in this room that will be forced into an eternity with God. God loves you too much to make you spend eternity with him. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. There's actually a verse that's really powerful. It sums this up really well. It says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, this is God speaking. He says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and, I will, and we will share a meal together as friends. What is God saying about the way he enters into a relationship with you? Notice he doesn't say, I come to the door surrounded by my SWAT team and we bang the door open and run in and sit down at the table and say, you, down, now, we're eating this meal together. He doesn't do that because that's not the way love works. He stands at the door of your heart and he knocks and he says, listen, I love you. If you love me, answer the door. Let's have a relationship together. You have the choice, and that's why we call this thing mutual assent. You both have to want this thing. The fourth thing that a contract is going to require is an offer and acceptance. Simply put, once this agreement is legal and there's a consideration on both sides and both parties want this thing, you're going to write down on paper. In fact, in the court of law, they've proven that this can even be a scribbled with a pencil on a bar napkin. It doesn't need to be typed in like Times New Roman on white legal paper to be an offer. You just got to make an offer. It's got to be uh, written down and then you got to have people sign it. Offer and acceptance. In John 3, 16 and 17, you probably know this verse. It says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. What does John 3, 16 tell us? The only way that you get to uh, step into this agreement that God has opened for you is you got to take a pen out and you got to sign it. You got to accept the offer. It's not enough just to understand the offer. God, I I love it. I know that you sent your son to die on the cross for me. I believe it. Uh, uh, No, listen, it's more than that. You have to accept this free gift of his son. In fact, in a way, because in the consideration is pretty much all on God's part. He's given you the righteousness that you need to enter into the relationship with him. So at the end of the day, really, what's, what's your job in this agreement? Sign the thing. God, I want a relationship with you. 
the way that sounded for me when I was about fifth grade. It was a prayer, something I, I said out loud with my parents, and it was simply, God, I understand what it was that you did for me on the cross, and I want a relationship with you. I accept you into my life. I don't know if you've done that. Here's the fifth thing. The fifth thing for a contract to be legal is capacity. In other words, both people have to be able to understand the agreement that they're entering into. If you drink too much and you find yourself in a drunken stupor and you rush into a wedding chapel in Vegas and you, you're like, hey, let's do this thing and you get married, all right? The next day, you'll probably have an easy time going into a courthouse and saying, I need this thing annulled because we didn't have the capacity to enter into this agreement. I was outside of myself. I wasn't thinking clearly. There's a YouTube video of a dad and he's sitting across from his son who's in kindergarten and he sets on a table a stack of $10,000 in cash. He says, son, right here I have $10,000 cash. And over here I have two Oreo cookies. I want you to pick which one you want. And the boy didn't even think. I mean, he's just like, stack of paper or cookies, right? He grabbed the cookies. He had no idea in that moment. He didn't have the capacity to understand that $10,000 can buy a lot of Oreo cookies, right? And so that's why... Certain, you know, children aren't able to enter into many legal contracts. That's why I have an aunt on my wife's side who's, she's elderly, but her whole life she hasn't had the mental capacity above that of a kindergartner. And that's why she has a power of attorney. If someone, if she wants to sell something, do something, move some money around, she has to use someone else to, to, who has capacity for her because she doesn't have it for herself. So a contract has to have capacity also. So now you might be thinking, what does any of this have to do with James chapter one and James chapter two? Let's explore this question for just a moment. In Matthew chapter 7, you're going you're gonna to find some of the scariest words of Scripture. If you're a believer in this room right now, I hope these words p make you pause and think about something for just a moment. Here's what it says in Matthew 7, verse 22. It says, On judgment day, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name, and we performed many miracles in your name. But Jesus will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. What scripture tells us is that one day, standing before the throne, there will be many people who think they're contractually obligated into heaven. And God's going to say, that contract was never valid. I don't know who you are. So which one of those five things then is going to be a problem for those five people. If one of these five things, maybe, I know I'm stretching a little bit. I'm using kind of earthly logic and earthly law school things to, to try to, but if you really think about it, if we, if we borrow this concept for just a moment, is it, you know, the concept of legality? Well, no, God's the, the king, he's the lawgiver, and he's the judge. If God says the contract is legal, it's legal. So we're going to throw that one out. No attorney is going to be able to attack that. What about the concept of consideration? We can all agree that consideration isn't fair. But again, if the judge says, I think it's a, a fair and legal contract that I'm willing to, to, to impugn my righteousness into someone because of my son's death on the cross so that they can enter into a relationship with me. If God says that's fair, it's fair. All right? You're not going to be able to poke holes in that argument. So it's not legality, it's not consideration. What about offer and acceptance? If you're a follower of Jesus in this room, I bet at some point you, you, you claim to have understood the offer that was being made to you and you accepted it. You said, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And so you probably prayed a prayer, signed something. You didn't probably sign something, right? You, you, you symbolically signed something. You prayed a prayer, raised your hand, came down, got baptized. You did something, and you're like, yep, I'm good. Offer an acceptance. Can't poke a hole at that. 
Well, what about capacity? I'm going to assume that you have the capacity to decide for yourself whether or not you want to enter into this agreement. By the way, there are a lot of people uh, that have died without the capacity to enter into this agreement. I believe heaven will be filled with millions of aborted babies who had uh, the soul, they were uh, made and created in the image of God, but they never were able to have the capacity to, to reject or accept this agreement. And they're, gonna, they're already in God's presence. But you, I believe you have the capacity to understand what, listen, you put your faith in me, what my son did for you on the cross, and you, you receive in exchange my righteousness and, and therefore a relationship that we're going to now have forever. You have the ability to understand that. So that's not, so what's left? If it's not legality, it's not consideration, it's not offer and acceptance, it's not capacity. The only thing that remains left standing is this concept of mutual assent. In other words, did Matt really want this? Did Matt really want a relationship with Jesus? Did both parties really want this? I know God really wants a relationship with you. The question is, is there any evidence in your life at all that you actually want a relationship with him? He's got his part covered. You see, a lawyer is going to attack the question of did both parties really want this? Now, here's where I had like a big aha moment as I was writing this message. I, I was looking at the Cornell law school website, and I was kind of trying to order this message using this, this analogy. And check this out. Here's what Cornell Law School says about mutual assent. It says, mutual assent is an essential element in the formation of a valid contract. Under modern contract law, mutual assent must be proven objectively. Thus, courts will look to outward expressions of the parties to determine mutual assent. In other words, you can't just go into the courtroom and say, judge, I really wanted this. I believed it in my heart. I, I just need you to read my mind for just a moment and you'll see that I'm being genuine. The judge is gonna say, listen, according to modern contract law, I can't, I can't do this thing subjectively. I need to see with outward expression that you actually wanted to be part of this thing. I'm going to need, need to see some works that match up with you claim as your faith. Let's look at James chapter 2, verses 14 and 17 again. These are, the, these are the verses that you guys said out loud, right? It says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. What a judge might say when it comes to our faith is, listen, you can tell me all you want that you wanted to be a part of this agreement, but I need to see objective evidence of fruit in your life of actual things that you've done that show that you actually want to be a part of this agreement. Otherwise, this contract is null and void. It's dead and useless. Now let me pause for a second and answer a, a difficult question. Does that mean that God is expecting perfection from you the day you give your life to Jesus? Even years later, right? it's been a long time since I've been a follower of Christ. Does that mean that by now I should have arrived at some point where God now expects me to have it all put together? Let me answer that question with scripture. In John 8, it says this, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family. But a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. What does this verse tell us about sin? And here's what it is. When you gave your life to Jesus, God did not free you from the struggle of sin. 
He did not take away any struggle or desire in you, that bend that you naturally have away from godliness. That wasn't corrected on the day you gave your life to Jesus. He didn't free you from the struggle of sin. What he freed you from was the bondage and slavery to sin. Guess what? The door of the cell is now open. Many of us, we like to still sleep in there. We like to return in there and we find comfort in that cell of our worldly living. But at the end of the day, we have the freedom now to walk out and to choose to do things differently. We have freedom from our sin. And so the, the question I really want us to explore is if there was an actual attorney who is trying to poke holes at your mutual assent and whether or not you actually wanted to be part of this relationship with God. I think that there would be five types of evidence that you would be able to present and say, listen, I really want this thing. And I have five pieces of evidence to prove it. Here's the first one. I think you would have evidence in your life of obedience and repentance. And let me tell you why these things go together. At the end of the day, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, guess what you're going to do? You're going to follow Jesus. It's right in the definition, right? I can't tell you how many times people have said, Matt, I've made a decision that I want Jesus to call all the shots in my life. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's great. Hey, you know the very first shot that God has already called? The very first thing he wants you to do now that you are a follower of Jesus, he wants you to get baptized, like, mm, I don't want to do that. They do you not see how that's a problem. You would enter into a contract saying, God, uh, I, I want to do things your way. And then uh, and the very first thing that God asks you to do, you're like, ah, I'm not into that. I'm not going to do that one. Are you a follower of Jesus or are you not? Are you going to do things God's way or your way? You see, that's, that's one of the questions you're going to explore. Are, are you being obedient to God? And by the way, because we're all imperfect, God hasn't freed us from our struggle of sin. When we do sin, is there evidence of repentance? Do you have a repentant spirit that says, God, I know that thing I just did. It wasn't in line with what I should have done. I disobeyed you instead of obeyed you. And now I want to turn from that and get back on track because I want to be in a relationship with you. The more I go off in this other direction, the farther away we get from each other. And I don't want to be far from you because I have a mutual assent that I want to be in relationship with you. And so I'm going to turn from my sin and get back on track. Is there evidence in your life of obedience and repentance? In fact, the young man that got baptized this morning, Blake, it was on our men's retreat weekend that he heard this message, a message very similar to what I'm preaching right now. And he said, you know what? Why am I not getting baptized? I gave my life to Jesus years ago. And he realized I, I need to be obedient. I need my life to have a clear reflection of obedience and repentance. In 1 Peter 2.24, it says that God, he personally carried out, carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Listen, you have the ability to turn from sin now. The question is, is there evidence in your life that you're doing that? Or is there sin patterns in your life that are so uh, ongoing that you're not even repentant anymore? You don't even care. That's an alarm bell. That's alarming. Here's the second thing, kind of growing off of number one, another piece of evidence is the, the word growth. In other words, do you find that when you do veer off the path, that that's starting to happen less and less as you become, as you grow in your relationship with Jesus? Are you veering off that path less? And when you do veer off, is it for a shorter distance that you veer off before you realize, nope, nope, I want to be in a relationship with Jesus? Or do you find yourself, some of you are so off on some other path that there's like not even a desire to get back onto God's path? And what you're seeing is, is the sin, the, the often, the, how often you're going off the path. It's not actually slowing down. It's actually increasing. In Romans 6, it says, Well, then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. 
Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? I want to um, put this one statement up on the screen for just a moment. It's a little bit of a gut punch, all right? I apologize in advance. Flex up your gut, all right? You ready? You're about to get punched in the gut. Here's the, here's the statement. Are you growing in your ability to live in holiness? Or are you just becoming better at asking for forgiveness? Some of you, you're like, Matt, every time I sin, I, I'm repentant. But what you're really showing is this evidence that you're getting better and better at asking for forgiveness instead of actually doing what you say you're going to do and getting better at walking on God's path. Here's a third piece of evidence that I'd hope you'd be able to present saying, I really want this thing, is it's the the word worship. Man, I... um, I was reading a book this past year called How to Worship a King. It's an incredible book if you want to study worship. And um, the author of the book, in one place in the book, he talks about how incredible it is, the truth, that God loved him so much that he sent his son to this earth to die on the cross in his place. And that because of that, he now gets to be seen by God as righteous and gets to have an eternal relationship with God, something he could never have given to himself. He's like, and then from a perspective of a worship leader, that he gets on stage and he's leading a congregation in worship. He's like, I, I don't understand how I can look down at people who claim to be followers of Christ, and I sit there and watch them as they are begrudgingly asked to just thank God for what he done, has done for them. They're standing there with their fists down, no words out of their mouth, not even a simple thank you, God, for the, the way you've changed my life. Do you have an inability to fully appreciate and grasp the greatness of what God has done for you? That would be one of those signs that maybe, maybe you've never actually entered into a relationship with Jesus. Or another way of putting that, are you even saved, bro? Like, how could you fully understand, and you're never going to fully understand, just even slightly understand the goodness of what God's done for you and have an inability to simply thank him for that in the way you praise him and honor him with your words. Here's another one is the word fellowship. Now, sometimes we, we get this word. It's a, it's a word that you only hear in church. We don't use this word outside of church, right? Churches have fellowship. We have fellowship halls, right? We, we think about this word and it simply means uh, getting together with other people. But it means so much more than that, right? Fellowship comes from this Greek word koinonia. It's where the body of Christ, we recognize that we have everything in common. The one thing that God tells the church to have in common, right, is this simply that we're, we're the body of Christ. Jesus is the head and all of us are to be connected as part of the body of Christ. So if you have someone who says, listen, I'd rather take my, the arm and I'd rather be over there uh, separated from the body, Do you know what you would call this arm after about an hour of not being on ice? It's dead. It's dead. And if you like to go through life, disconnect by the body, disconnecting the body, refusing your connection to the church, refusing your connection to the church, refusing to be part of this thing that God has done, he's put believers together. The fifth thing I want to challenge you on this morning is the word sacrifice. In Romans 12, verse 1, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. And let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. You know, in this verse, when you see this verse, 
Notice it starts with the words, and so. Your, your copy of God's word might say, therefore. You know what Paul is talking about when he's writing this letter to the church in Rome? He's talking about Romans 1 through 11. This chapter 12, it's a transition chapter. It's in light of everything we just talked about in the first half of the book, this is the response. You know, you go to book, the book of Romans and you see the Romans road, right? In Romans chapter 3, we learn that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, right? We learn that for the wages of our sin is death. All of us deserve to die. But the free gift of God is that he's put uh, his son uh, as, a, as a sacrifice on your behalf on the cross so that you can be imputed with righteousness and enter into this relationship with him. We learn in Romans 10, right, that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you can enter into this agreement. And so when Paul's writing Romans 12, what he's simply saying is, in light of everything we just covered, in light of the gospel, in light of the truth that God loves you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross in your place so that you can be in a relationship with him, a reasonable act of worship would be to open your hands and say, God, you can have whatever you want. Imagine for a moment that we entered into that agreement where you sold me your car for $8,000 that I gave you, but just yesterday you gave me the $8,000 to give to you. Imagine now three months from now, you call me up and you're like, hey, Matt, I got got a little bit bit of a pickle I'm in. Do you mind if I borrow your car today? Imagine if my response was, <laughs> no, man, my car. You'd probably be a little like, hmm? no, you know what my response would be? My response would be, of course you can use the car. It's, I know it's legally mine, but it's technically yours. You paid for it, right? And that's kind of the attitude that we ought to have when we recognize God paid for your life on the cross. And therefore, the response ought to be, God, technically you can have anything you want. You paid for all this. Everything I have is yours. The fact that we're in a relationship, that's because of you. The fact that one day I'm going to be in eternity in heaven with you, that's because of you. Whatever you want, it's yours. Up to and including my very life if you want it. And see, that's what we call open-handed living. But is there any evidence in your life that you live sacrificially in light of what God did for you on the cross? Is there any evidence that you're living for things outside of yourself Do you serve with open hands? Do you give with open hands? Do you sacrifice? Do you do do? do, Are are there any? Is there any evidence, outward expression of evidence, that your faith is not dead? And by the way, I know that the cost of following Jesus isn't actually free. The Bible says that when you become a follower of Jesus and you embrace this thing called sacrifice, there's going to be a cost of being a disciple of Jesus. It's going to cost you something. It may even cost you your life. It probably won't. But is there evidence that it's costing you something? Are you willing to open up your hands and live? Because listen, at the end of the day, We know that the legality of this deal is not in question. There's no consideration question. There's no question about the, you know, capacity of this. Uh, There's been an offer and an acceptance. The question is, is your faith dead? Do you really want this relationship with Jesus? And I think what's going to be looked at when James is saying, let's, in fact, let's read this, you know, that verse again in James chapter 2. When it says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you claim to have faith but don't show it by your actions, can that kind of faith save anyone? Simply put, if there is no outward expression of fruit that you actually want to follow Jesus, that you want to be connected to his church, that you want to grow in your ability to follow him more and more closely, that when you mess up, you want to get back in line and do things his way, is there any evidence of that in your life? I can't answer that question. I hope you can answer that question. You know, it brings us to a really important question I want you to ask God right now, which is, God, what now? What do you want me to do with this this stuff that Matt just shared with me? And I have two ideas of, of something God might be putting on your heart right now. One of them, 
You know, in the book of uh, Revelation, God writes this letter to the church in Ephesus. And one of the things he says to the church in Ephesus is that you have forsaken your first love. In other words, you used to be on fire for me, and now that, that flame, it's kind of flickering. I'm starting to see an awful lot of smoke and not a lot of flame. And so maybe what God's calling you to do right now, you've already, you've made a real decision to follow Jesus. But to be honest, if you really are honest with yourself, there's a lot of holes that could be poked in this whole thing. And there's not a lot of fruit right now in your life. And what you need to do is return to your first love. That God's putting something on your heart right now. He's saying, I need you to sacrifice in this way that you're not willing to do. I need you to be more obedient to me. There's this sin pattern in your life that you're just, have, you've have gotten to the point now, you've just accepted it as normal. And you're not even willing to turn away from it anymore. You know, you're, you're trying to do life on your own and you're no longer connecting to the church that I've given to you to be part of the body of Christ. What is it right now that God has put on your heart that you need to do? Maybe it's five things. I don't know what it is, but that you are need to do to rekindle that flame and, and return to your first love. For some of you in this room, the thing that you need to do is turn to your first love. You don't even, you haven't even experienced the love of God yet. You've never started that relationship with Jesus. And today's the day where you can say, I've tried all sorts of things. None of them work. I think I'm going to turn to Jesus for the first time and let him be the, the joy that I've been looking for. If, if either one of those are your, your things that God's put on your heart, maybe he's giving you a lot more detail. I, I praise God alongside you that God is able and willing to communicate to all of our hearts today something that he wants us to work on. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this book that you've given to us. Thank you for the letter that you prompted James to write to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. We are a, a group of believers here in this building, and we need to be challenged with this hard truth that we can claim with our mouth all we want that we are followers of you. But if there's no evidence of that, if there's no works, if there's no a repentance, if there's no fellowship and no worship in our lives, if there's just no outward signs and expression of work and fruit in our lives, it's a good sign that the faith we think we have is not real. God, I don't want a single person to walk out of here today outside of a true, genuine faith in you. So if there's someone in this room right now that just needs to enter into that relationship with you, uh, maybe for them, it's the first time they're doing it for real. Maybe for others, it's the first time they've even been invited into this relationship. I pray that you would let them do business today here with you and let it be genuine. Let there be mutual assent that both parties really want this thing. And for those in this room that we do, God, we've always wanted a relationship with you. But there's a lot of evidence to the contrary right now in our lives. Would you help us to deal with that, Father? Because we want there to be a clear, overwhelming evidence that we want to be part of this agreement and in this relationship with you as much as you want to be in it with us. God, tell us something right now that you want us to do and give us the courage to do it. We love you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.